recorded the cloud. And we are all set to go. Well, thank you, everybody. And welcome, Joanne. And, Let uh, me we are told... the floor, then I will turn things back to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, go ahead. I just wanted to um, welcome all of you who are here, a good, goodly number of you, um, and mention the topic for today, which you know if you've been following me on Twitter or looking at the NCHE site. Um, last week, we talked about the press. This week, we're going to talk about the press again. Last week, we introduced the partisan nature of the press. We looked at a newspaper. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about the long history of presidents and the press um, using a particularly beloved document. Um, but before we jump into that, now I will turn things over uh, to Matt, who will discuss how to ask questions, because of course, after I blather for however long I blather, we will then have a Q&A period. Yeah, thank you, everybody, and welcome to it, uh, another episode of um, History Matters and So Does Coffee. Um, uh, before I give the rules, just my uh, weekly pitch to join us here at the National Council for History Education. We provide programming and um, colloquia, webinars, all kinds of professional development opportunities for anybody who's interested in history and history education. So please come to www.nche.net and join us. Um, so our usual rules apply here. Uh, if you are comfortable, go ahead and put your uh, location and in the chat box. We always like to hear where people are coming from. Um, but please keep your comments, uh, you know, polite. Um, if you have a question for Joanne as we go along, please put it in the Q&A box. That can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, Joanne's going to talk for a little bit, and then we're going to open it up to questions, and we will go from there. So thanks a lot, and I'm going to go hide and uh, give Joanne uh, your undivided attention. <laughs> okay. Okay, dokie. There we go. Okay. Um, so as I just said, um, we're talking about the press again. Last week, we talked about um, how partisan it was. We talked about the fact that um, political parties tended to support presses, that objectivity didn't come along until the 19th century. We also talked about how vital the press was, just as information that foreign visitors would come and note that Americans are a newspaper people, that people who didn't get newspapers talked about being, to use their words, in the dark, that they didn't know what the government was doing. So in essence, we talked last week about the, the problematic aspects of the press and the fact that um, the free press was vital as a tool of accountability. And we looked at a um, newspaper that showed us a little bit of both of those things going on. But those were the two main messages of last week. And those are both important to bear in mind as we segue uh, to what we're going to be discussing this week, which is presidents and the press. Um, and part of my part of the reason why I decided to talk about the press and part of the reason why it ends up being two weeks is, um, you know, generally, there's uh, an impulse for people to look at the present and um, announce that it, everything is the worst it's ever been, everything. And that, you know, the press is worse than it's ever been, that, you name it, it's the worst it's ever been. And in one way or another, in some ways, there are aspects that we need to consider along those lines. But if you're talking about the nature of politics, um, the fact of the matter is, and I've said this before, I know, um, there is no golden age of beautiful American politics. There just isn't. Um, a lot of the problems that we're having now as far as a free press and what it does that's good and what it does that's bad and the vulnerability and instability of democracy and all of these other things, they have a long history. And so presidents having issues with the press has a long history. It goes all the way back to the dawn of the Republic. And that's what I want to do today is talk about Washington and Adams and Jefferson, talk about their relationship with the press, what they thought about it, and what they did about it, and what that suggests to how we think about the press today. And I'll start by saying um, all of them and, and others in that period, you know, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, they certainly were immersed in the same um, 
thought world that I described at the outset about a free press being important, about it enforcing accountability, all of that stuff. So at the outset, uh, they're entering a, a new government. They're the first three presidents, so things are really still wobbly and in, they're, they're insecure, fragile, and they're very aware of the fact that a free press is important and is a tool of accountability in government. I think last week I quoted Thomas Jefferson saying a free press is a curb on politicians. However, they didn't like being, these presidents didn't like being attacked in the press. Uh, they didn't like seeing newspapers scream about their politics. Um, they didn't like the lies and exaggeration and complained about it. Uh, they worried about the impact that the newspapers might have on the public. So in other words, they did a lot of worrying and hating and anger concerning the press that, that you know, that's what presidents do when they're being criticized by the press. But what I want to talk about now is what they did. Um, so I want to start with George Washington. George Washington is a man who is not used to being criticized, right? I mean, generally speaking, you know, a gentleman of the 18th century already had issues with being criticized, but Washington, by the time he becomes the first president, he was already revered, right? He's already father of his country. This is a man who does not like being criticized. His first term, if there ever was a partially golden moment, might have been Washington's experience of his first term in which people held back, they didn't really criticize him, new government, new president, he's George Washington. First term was kind of quiet on that front and partisanship wasn't yet at a real boil. By the end of 1792, now you really have Federalists and Republicans smacking at each other and now you begin to have newspapers taking part in the smacking. Washington does not like this, but luckily for us, we have a first person account of him not liking this. Um, and it comes from 1793. So it comes from um, not that long after you really are beginning to have scary partisan politics. I think it's in September of 1792 that Washington writes to both Hamilton and Jefferson and says, I didn't realize what was going on here to the degree it's going on, but you both have to back off because this is endangering the government. So that's the climate we're in in 1793. And there's a French minister in the United States who's causing controversy. And there's a lot of discussion about what should be done about this minister, Citizen Genet. And in relation to that, what should be done in relation to France, which seems to be trying to woo the American public. How should America deal with France? Should they declare neutrality, which is what the Federalists want, they're not in love with France, or should they remain allied with France, which is what the Republicans want, and they argue, well, they were our allies during the revolution, how can we turn our back now? So France, 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 that's what's being discussed. Okay, which brings us to the document. Um, it, it, it's from August of 1793, and I'll point out the first sentence only because, how can I not? Um, so the, the document, it's notes of a cabinet meeting in August 1793. The notes were taken by Jefferson. Uh, so bear that in mind, and particularly <laughs> the first sentence. The first sentence of these notes are, met again, Hamilton spoke again <laughs> three quarters of an hour. <laughs> he, Jefferson really hated what he called Hamilton's jury speeches. <laughs> during cabinet meetings. I will do get on a topic and then go. So here's another speech. But the part I wanna focus on is further down and it has to do with Henry Knox, Secretary of War, um, talking about a, a cartoon. Okay, so this is what Jefferson writes. Henry Knox, Secretary of War. Knox, in a foolish, incoherent sort of a speech, introduced the pasquinade or satire, and in this case, a cartoon, lately printed called the funeral of George Washington and James Wilson, who was on the Supreme Court, king and judge, where the president was placed on a guillotine. Okay, so Henry Knox in this meeting, while they're talking about this fraught subject, is like, hey, any of you guys seen this cartoon that they're selling on the street? It's called the death of George Washington, the funeral of George Washington, and it shows him being guillotined, right? Okay, that wasn't good. The president was much inflamed got into one of those passions when he cannot command himself, run on much on the personal abuse which had been bestowed on him, defied any man on earth to produce one single act of his since he had been in the government, which was not done on the purest motives, that he had never repented but once 
the having slipped the moment of resigning his office, and that was every moment since. <laughs> That's a great sentence. That by God, he'd rather be in his grave than in his present situation. That he'd rather be on his farm than to be made emperor of the world. And yet they were charging him with wanting to be a king. That that rascal Freneau, editor, who's the editor of the Jeffersonian National Gazette, sent him, sent Washington three copies of his paper every day as if he thought Washington would become the distributor of his papers, that he could see in, in this nothing but an impudent design to insult him. He ended on this high tone, and this is my favorite sentence. Jefferson writes, there was a pause, some difficulty in resuming our question, which is my favorite because Washington has this rant and you can just, Jefferson there is attesting to the fact that when the rant is done, everyone is sort of sitting in the room, right? It's like, now what do we do? <laughs> How do we get going in the conversation again? Um, so that's a wonderful example of a president losing control over an attack in the press. And he really, he, Washington tended to restrain that impulse and here he does not restrain it really well. But he dislikes it, he doesn't like being attacked. Um, he sometimes speaks out in ways that anger Republicans about what he thinks is dangerous resistance, but he doesn't restrain the press and he, he, he doesn't um, He doesn't do anything really except Be angry about it in private and allow that to go on and then happily resign and go back to Mount Vernon John Adams Comes into office and now we have someone who's not just him but the Federalists a little bit more active about a free press and its problems during Adams' presidency, you have what became known as the quasi-war with France. So uh, maneuvers with France are now heated up. The late 1790s, you get this quasi-war in which we're not quite at war, but we're still engaged in hostilities. Federalists are in power. Federalists are not fond of France and the sort of flame of revolution and what they see as democratic frenzy going on that it might contaminate the United States. And so now there's this quasi-war. So Federalists take advantage of this moment. Hey, you know, this is a moment when we really need national security. So how about if we pass some acts to encourage national security during a time of crisis, and they, the Federalists generally, and Adams supports it, pass the Alien and Sedition Acts. They argue that during a time of crisis, we need to feel safe about immigrants who are in our country, uh, and we need to protect the reputations of officers of, in the national government because during a time of crisis, the government needs to have all the power it, ha it can have. And this is a new government. So if you attack the reputations of the people in office, basically that's what's holding the national government up. So they're claiming national security, the Federalists. Obviously, they're thinking about partisan politics and they say so in private letters, right? Like, this is great. Like we can, we can smash the Republican press, right? We can silence them. We'll say it's national security. It really is on some level, but they're dangerous, that press. They're riling up the people. This is a good opportunity to quash them. So there are trials for people under the Sedition Act. There are people who are imprisoned under the Sedition Act. This is the aggressive restraining of the press by the Federalists who are uncomfortable with the um, instability of, of real democratic politicking. They don't like what would have been called the politics of the street, right? The, the Republicans, the Jeffersonian Republicans are much more comfortable with that. The Federalists do not like that and are constantly trying to rein it in. So Alien and Sedition Acts are in line with the Federalists kind of being uncomfortable with democracy. They take these acts, which are pretty aggressive, and what happens? The American public responds by voting them out of office, right? Adams and the Federalists lose the presidency, not only because of this, but it sure helps. And the next president, Jefferson, is from the opposite party, the party that's more comfortable with democracy. The nation is moving towards a more democratic politics. John Adams and the Federalists are not moving in that direction, and so that's what we're watching take place. So now, Jeffersonian Republicans in office what happens with the press? Now Jefferson, like every other, the two presidents before him, really, really, really does not like the press attacking him, understands the importance of a free press, and understands that 
the American public need to believe in a free press. So although he doesn't like people attacking him, he doesn't go on the national stage and either privately or in any other way push people to take action. However, he does privately ask one or two attorneys general in the states and Connecticut in particular, he asked Connecticut's attorney general that he might bring some suits against people who are attacking him and the government just to kind of teach people a lesson, right? It's not the Sedition Act, but it's a, it's a president kind of prodding at the press and saying, I hate this and I'm gonna do something quiet and behind the scenes, not huge and not gonna sort of make the press look horrible to the American public. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna kind of hide what I'm doing, but maybe it'll make things better for me. Um, he, he won't be the last president to have an issue with the press, to do something like that about it. And the way he's doing it is very in line with um, a Republican small R politics. There's a letter I found a long time ago um, that says something like, um, in a Republican small R government, um, the process of government is government by sleight of hand. Meaning the public governs in a Republic. So whatever you're doing, kind of have to be tricky with what you're doing. And that's in a sense what we see Jefferson doing here. So we see these presidents denouncing the press, some of them actually trying to restrain the press. We see the fact that there is no period, except maybe for Washington's first term, when presidents are free from attacks in newspapers. And we see that they all understood in one way or another the importance, the vital importance of a free press and the way it held people in power accountable. They didn't necessarily like that when they were in power, but they understood all of that. Now, this brings us back to the present day. And, and as always, you know, I talk about these documents and events and people and stories in the past in my time period that I love, partly to talk about how we look at the past. And then always I pivot and talk about the present because the past doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, we can't base what we're doing now on some static idea of the past, but the ways in which we think about the past can help us think about the present. And so this is another example of that. There has always been an understanding that a free press is important. We can see presidents acting on that. Um, we can see the impact of, of not having a free press. We can see people feeling that they're in the dark. What we have to do in a sense is what people were doing in early America in the face of this, which is be smart consumers, right? We, week after week, part of what I'm doing with these conversations is arguing again and again that we need to be savvy and smart and um, observant and active in this moment, right? That we should always be that way. That a, a democratic politics requires that level of activity we need to be in that mindset now because there's a lot going on and we need to be thinking about what's going on and what we think about it and what we think should or shouldn't happen. In that kind of climate, of course, there's the press is gonna do what it does. And of course, we talk about the press today and we talk about uh, we, its failures, what it isn't doing, what it is doing. Um, it's even been called the enemy of the people. Um, it's fine to critique the press, to denounce the press, to complain about the press, but to declare it the enemy of the people is a problem because that flies in the face of everything that I talked about last week and this week, which is regardless of its failures, despite the fact that a lot of what it's pumping out may or may not be true, you can't always rely on the press. Despite all of that, it's a vital, vital tool of accountability. And that's what these past presidents are recognizing and that's an important thing that we need to recognize as we wrestle with the current press. It's important when you're thinking about the press, and I think particularly now when we talk about the press so much, not to confuse the contents of the press, what they're reporting, versus the purpose of the press. The contents can be problematic, and we can, you know, as Americans, complain about that and push for different things. We have a right to engage with the press. The purpose of the press is a separate matter and a free press, that purpose is important. So it's important even as you're getting upset at the contents to defend the purpose. Those are not necessarily the same thing. And that's some of what I've been talking about last week and this week. Um, I'll 
close here with um, one final idea and then I'll open things up for question. I said this um, last week that particularly when you're looking at the press, but in general, every week it's I'm offering a reminder that democracy isn't a spectator sport. Democracy requires action. Democracy requires thoughtfulness. Um, it requires us to be observant. It requires us to be aware. It requires us to think about what we think is right and wrong. It requires us to be active. And probably more than any other period in my life, I can see now that Americans are engaging with politics in that way. And that aspect of it, the fact that people are really engaging in and thinking about the political process and, and what is or isn't good according to their lights, that's good, right? It's nice to be able to say a good thing and that's a good thing that um, people being engaged with politics and thinking about it and active, that's, that's a positive. The press I think is an extreme example of that because it's so obviously problematic in so many ways and it's so vital, it just requires our being smart consumers, thinking about what we're seeing, thinking about what we're being pushed to think or respond to, thinking about our emotional reactions to things before we have the emotional reaction, basically stepping back and thinking about the evidence in the same way that we step back and think about evidence in the past. Okay, um, I am going to stop there. However, as always, um, before I continue, how can I move on without the mug? Um, so this is actually, it, it says on caffeine, it's from the NPR show on the media. Okay, so I'm very proud of myself because- yeah, That's a great one. I had two media mugs. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, so anyway, that on the media, that's the theme. But my larger message I think is really important. I try to pass it on to my students to think about government, to take part in government, to not be spectators. And um, this week as every other week, I guess that's what I'm really asking. Okay. Well, thank you, that was wonderful. Well, we do have some questions rolling in. Um, my fair warning though to our audience, um, if I get done with your questions, you're gonna be stuck with my questions. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so please get some in there. There's uh, six questions in here so far. Um, the first one is, um, I'm going to ask the question part of this. So this is, has yellow journalism impacted presidential press relations in the past? Have you, do you know um, how, any comments on yellow journalism? And well, I can't, I can't um, point to specific examples, but what I can say is, <laughs> yes. I mean, the press always shapes politics and always shapes presidencies in different ways, right? So presidents are well aware that a friendly press can do a lot of good things for them as in the same way that they're well aware that an unfriendly press can do bad things. Technological changes and, and major changes in communication shape politics enormously. And that's just as true for the presidency as for everything else. So I think I mentioned last week, um, maybe I didn't, uh, steam powered printing presses, the telegraph, the railroad, right? Change the natures of the, the press, the, the ways that it gets communicated, the speed with which it can be communicated and politics changes. And that's just as true if you look over time, the reach of newspapers um, and the content changing, the, you know, the wider the reach in a sense and the more money being made with it, there's sensationalism is born and that has an impact too. So. The press and communication and democracy, I guess is part of what I'm saying, are um, bound up and all each influences the other. Um, and that would be as true for yellow journalism as it would be true for any other phase of journalism in American history. Excellent. Um, did the early presidents have a favorite newspaper or reporters from Emily? Um, did the early presidents have a favorite newspaper or reporter or did they give interviews? Oh, um, well, I mean, you know, they had, early presidents certainly had newspapers they liked better than others. I mean, in the case of George Washington, he was not a big fan of the Jeffersonian Republican National Gazette, right? He complains about it in the quote. He was much happier with the Gazette of the United States, which was federalist in its leanings, which was friendly to his administration. Um, 
you know, was he actively engaged with uh, Fenno, its editor, trying to create things in the press? Not so much, but yeah, he favored one over another. And I think that's generally true. And when you move into the um, 19th century, you really do begin to see um, when newspapers become what's known at the time as party organs, right? Tools really of political parties promoting a party's purpose, then presidents are even more engaged with their favored newspaper in that way because their cause and their side and their power is now bound up with a particular newspaper. So yeah, I think there are favorites and there are ones that are not favored. The question then becomes how do presidents respond to that fact? What do they do with that fact? People know, you know, people understood that Andrew Jackson had one particular paper that he liked or that Thomas Jefferson would like one paper more than another. The question then is, what's the impact of that? Wonderful. Uh, just a quick reminder to folks, if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A section. Um, I happened to catch a couple that came through chat, but if they're, I'm asking them from the Q&A list, which is over top of chat at the moment. So I'm not gonna see your questions if they're in chat. Um, regarding the cartoon in the, the Oh Grab Me part, political cartoon, um, it's a reference to Jefferson's, this is from Jennifer, um, and Jefferson's Embargo Act. My students always ask me if there's any significance to the turtle, why, why the cartoonist chose a turtle. Do you have any sense of that? I should. <laughs> oddly specific question, but not oddly, but it's this very specific question, but it, yeah, it struck me as interesting. I so. should. I really should because, I really should because um, the cover of a book I edited. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot. I'm going to have to look it up and, and tell you next week, which I'm happy to do. Yep. It has fallen out of my brain, even though it's on the cover of a book I co-edited. So... <laughs> Uh, do you, um, let's see, where'd it go? There it is. Do you have any sense of uh, the idea of a press conference or press release when those kind of came into our consciousness as a society? Um, what is the historical context of the press conference, press release phenomena? Well, again, that's a, that's more a 19th century thing. Okay. Um, when you look at, uh, like when you look at Congress in the first half of the 19th century, um, you see kind of a mix of the press being engaged with politics and being part of the political structure, kind of like a press conference is, and the press standing back and doing what it wants to do. So for example, you had reporters up in the galleries, uh, the visitors galleries in the House and Senate reporting on what happened and then going back to their newspaper. So there was, that, and there was, often a reporter's gallery. So the reporters, in a sense, were bunched there together watching what was going on. That's not a press conference, but it's a <laughs> press moment. Um, and then they would go back to their offices and you know, write up what they heard. What's interesting about those early moments of reporters watching and then reporting is that congressmen had the right to go to the newspaper office and then read the account of what they'd said and correct it, right? So it's a mix of control and lack of control and observing and not observing. I mean, the press, this is going to be an understatement, it's messy <laughs> because it's so important. Because it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as press releases, um, I would say the, the equivalent that I could think of would be um, if a favored newspaper, if an editor in a favored newspaper made a bold declaration, someone reading that would assume that that might be coming from someone in power. So it's not an official press release, but people understood, they thought about what, who supported the paper, what, who was the editor, what was the relationship between the editor and the president, and thus, what did it mean? What did the tone of things mean? Or what did hints of things mean as to what was really an official assertion of a president? So people were aware of that. That's really helpful. A um, couple questions about the readership of newspapers. Uh, and we talked about this in the past um, a few weeks ago. We talked about sort of the idea of newspapers generally. Um, but what was the readership of, of 
of newspapers in the Federalist area. This is for, um, combining a couple questions here, sorry, from Kate and Lindsay. Um, what was the readership of newspapers in the Federalist era and how much difference did it make in terms of the, um, the distributive capacities of the material? Um, in other words, was it, how influential was, was it when it came to the, the way that it affected what presidents can and can't do, I think is what they're trying to get at. Okay. Well, um, in the period that I talked about today, you know, I think that the National Gazette and the Gazette of the United States, they were considered national newspapers. They were in the capital, you know, well, Philadelphia at the time, um, and they were trying to be national in reach. I believe that they had roughly 2,500 subscribers. Um, but I mentioned last time, although that sounds like a tiny number, newspapers were valued. They were passed from hand to hand. They were read aloud at taverns and coffee houses. Um, there was a much wider reach of news than there were actual physical newspapers. Um, and, you know, things that were, you can, you can see things in the newspaper having an impact on politics, right? That's part of what you can do uh, if you, and now particularly we have databases, you can go into a database and look at what the press is screaming about and then look around to see if there's an impact on that. That's, that's true even back to the days of the revolution when um, people were reporting in newspapers what was happening in other colonies re re related to the revolution and other places would say, oh, they're doing that, we can do that too. So absolutely, newspapers aren't just reporting, they're, they're shaping actions and people are um, often using them that way. Um, and I, this, I'm going to butcher the person's name, so I'm not even going to say it. But the question is, how did the Federalists so dislike, or why did the Federalists so dislike the democracy on the streets? Well, so this is going to be a vast <laughs> overgeneralization. And um, maybe Alexander Hamilton will zap me for it. But <laughs> generally speaking, generally speaking, um, the Federalists didn't necessarily want a monarchy per se, but they felt that basically the public should vote people into office and then step out of the way and let their betters rule, right? They were uncomfortable with, you know, demonstrations and protests and all of these things that they thought could subvert, could, could topple the government. That to them felt unrestrained, uncontrolled, dangerous, and particularly with what was going on with France, they worried all the time, the Federalists, that whatever was happening over there was going to come here and contaminate us. So generally speaking, the Federalists wanted a strong centralized national government. Um, they wanted a powerful executive, and they wanted um, a pleasantly quiet populace. Um, a great example of this uh, actually is Hamilton. Um, there's a crowd that's upset um, about the Jay Treaty. They form a crowd and they're ranting about it. It's a big deal. And Hamilton, in his response, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like the crowd. In his response, there's a letter in which he says something along the lines of, you know, I could go knock on the doors of the people in that crowd and explain the treaty to them, like one by one. And they'll <laughs> like it. Like he's, he's uncrowdifying the crowd, right? He's saying, well, it was a crowd. I don't like the crowd. And if I could talk to the one person at a time, I could probably persuade them. The Federalists just didn't trust that kind of action and didn't want it. And Jefferson and the Republicans pretty consistently, although it tweaks itself a little when they're in power, they were much more comfortable with, with a really much more democratic politics. And in the 1790s, who knew what direction the nation was going to go? Right. And that's part of why the politics were so fraught in that decade. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that in the past, that the, it, we like to think about this, that time period as, well, this is just what happened. But there was nothing definite about where the country was going at this time. It was... Right, that was um, the first, our first conversation was about contingency, so. Yeah. Um, uh, a good question from an anonymous attendee. I forgot to turn off the anonymous part. Um, <laughs> did, did relations between the press and politicians, not necessarily presidents, but politicians in the early Republic ever devolve to the point of, of being physical? Oh. Attacks, duels, very intense glares, etc. I love that duels is next to very intense glares in this question. That's intense. Um, 
certainly um, politicians and pe people in power um, took out, vented their feelings about the press on editors. You know, being an editor, you had to have a certain degree of oomph um, because you were running a little bit of a risk depending on what you put in your newspaper. However, um, and I, this is one of the reasons why I got interested in dueling. You only duel between equals, right? You only duel your equal. And part of what I was interested in was people saying, well, I can't duel you, you're not my equal. And my thinking, based on what? Like, how do they know that? And how can I figure that out? And there's an example. So Philip Freneau, who's the editor of the National Gazette, the Republican newspaper, he went to college with James Madison. They're friends. And yet, Freneau is seen, becomes an editor, he is seen as beneath Madison. And because you were beneath, you know, a, a politician in power in this way, in this time period, you were not good enough for a duel. You were not mm. equal to the person you have set. So you were caned. You were, you were wow. physically attacked with a cane. And there are a lot of newspaper editors who get seriously, seriously attacked um, with canings. The editor of uh, the New York Post, the Evening Post, which was Hamilton supported that with a bunch of other Federalists, his name is William Coleman. And he gets attacked, caned so badly that I think he's permanently injured. I want to say that he couldn't walk properly again after that point. So this isn't sort of like, you know, whack, 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 bad man, bad man. This is like, you have insulted my reputation and I shall now bring vengeance against you. So yeah, being a newspaper editor, and that holds true um, wow. through the 19th century. I, I talk in my most recent book about editors in the Capitol building and congressmen confronting them and caning them in the galleries and congressmen standing back and allowing it to happen because it seemed fair, right? So yeah, you definitely some of these men took vengeance on the press, but the press had power and they knew it. There, there's a great incident in which um, a congressman stands up and says something about two particular editors he hates. And he says, or reporters, and he says, you know, if I were them, I'd be careful because I don't like what they're saying. They better watch out, right? Mm -hmm. And so these two Congress, these two editors, journalists are like, they understand that message. They arm mm -hmm. themselves, right? They come to the reporter's gallery armed. One of them has a, I think what he called a big stick, <laughs> which I think is a cane. Um, and they're scared because apparently the guy who said this is a big guy. But what they do is from the moment this guy makes that assertion, that threat, they stop reporting him. They just really? cut him right out. They start, they basically say, Mr. So-and-so made some comments. And after a couple of weeks, Mr. So-and-so stands up and apologizes to the reporters because without being reported on, he's basically invisible. Mm -hmm. That's a real demonstration of the power of the press and, and reporters who were intelligent in how they used it. Uh, wow, that's incredible. That seems like that would have some, that would resonate with, you know, in the last... 30, 40 years um, as well, you know, as media has become the, as the 24 hour news cycle has emerged, it's, it seems like similar issues might, might be um, relevant. Um, Emily asks what, uh, by the way, we're, we're at 1045. And so we'll go another couple questions and then uh, call it a day. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody for all your participation and well. We'll end it relatively soon here, but we do have a few more questions. Emily asks, what is, what's the impact of international newspapers on Americans during this time? Um, how, how is the international press treating us? Oh, well, so those are two different things. So, so the international press, you know, in the, particularly in the early, early Republic, um, Americans assumed that they were the center of attention of the entire world. Like we are engaged in a great experiment and the world is watching and the world was watching, but the world was not watching quite as closely as Americans thought they were, but they were reporting on what was going on and they were, you know, France favored Republicans and England favored Federalists. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting and important about that particular time period, nowadays we talk about domestic politics and, and foreign affairs as though they're two separate things. In this time period, that's just not the case. Um, in this period, there's a great Madison quote uh, in the 1790s, and he says something like, all of our domestic affairs are foreign affairs, and all of our foreign affairs are economic affairs, and all of our economic, he just, it's one big blob. Mm -hmm. So 
and you could see that today in the fact that, you know, Washington is being attacked in the press partly for his feelings about France, right? Politics is one big blob of controversy and it's assumed that foreign affairs will have an intense impact on domestic politics because if the nation sides with either France or England, the assumption is that will shape the nature of the American Republic. They will become sort of more old worldy British by siding with Britain or, you know, might be a little more democracy loving if they side with France. So there's a lot of concern about tainting, foreign uh, nations tainting the early Republic. So they're, they're bound up together. That's great. Um, so Matthew asks, if I can find it, there it is. Um, have presidents ever worked with the press without the general public knowing to, to tell or shape a narrative or convey a message that the president also backs or agrees with? So is, is that sort of, yeah, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to give you a general answer to that and I'm going to say, yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I can't, I, I, an example of that in the early Republic is not popping into my mind, but um, for sure, you know, probably Andrew Jackson is a great example of that where he would meet with an editor, they would talk behind the scenes um, and things would happen in the newspaper and that was all seen as a, you know, democratic machine. Um, mm -hmm. But I can't, I can't cite specific examples right now. They're not popping into my head, along with the turtle. <laughs> 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 my head. I, I'm like stumping you today. I don't mean to. Um, but I, I think it's a fair point. I mean, as you mentioned before, you know, the one editor was one of uh, Madison's friends. And, you know, it's not like they didn't see each other. They came from the same sort of, um, you know, social circles in some respects. So it's not mm -hmm. like there wouldn't be some backroom dealing probably going on. Um, Orland asks a good question. I'm going to skip the first part because it's a little on the political side, but the second part is um, what presidents in your mind were prone to the ty types of outbursts that um, uh, historically that uh, Washington went through with that Jefferson described in, in the um, oh. document for today. So um, are there other presidents and, that you would point to as sort of this, overly oversensitivity in the historical era. Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's, Washington tended to restrain himself, but that's an example of Washington. John Adams on occasion lost it when he was president. Um, there's a moment where he basically discovers the influence that Hamilton has over his own Adams' cabinet and he throws a fit and he fires people and yells at people and it's bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have the account of one of the cabinet officers uh, who resigns after that. Um, so we know that that happened. Um, Andrew Jackson, <laughs> I almost don't have to say more, right? Andrew Jackson right. Um, used anger as a political tool to the point that, um, he, you know, he was famous for his rages and for being unpredictable and what was he going to do in anger. And sometimes there are accounts where he would have a rage and then people would leave the room and he would say to someone, okay, well that showed him, you know, like yeah. effective <laughs> as always. So he, he was sometimes performing that, um, but you could march through, you know, like I said, actually at the outset, there's a long history of presidents being really ticked off at the press. And um, I don't know who wouldn't, actually Jefferson probably didn't have an open rant. He's not that kind of guy. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you could mark through American history and find those examples. That's wonderful. Well, let me ask one last question and then uh, we'll, we'll call it a day. And this is uh, more about the process of the, the document you provided today, which is Jefferson was a frequent note taker at, at cabinet meeting. He was a free, frequent note taker of everything, he and, and Hamilton both. And, um, you know, I get, and, and so this is John Hannon asks, uh, I haven't read Linda Chervinsky's book yet, but was Jefferson a frequent note taker at cabinet meetings? And um, my understanding is, yes, is that correct? Yeah, yes. no, Jefferson um, was a frequent note taker. I mean, he just took notes. Yeah. Uh, cabinet meetings, um, after dinner parties. Um, it, it, there's a goofy story about that. So I was, um, and actually Lindsay Chervinsky's book on Washington's cabinet, I should have mentioned that before, but that's a great, it's a new book and that's an excellent 
read on some of the topics I was talking about today. Um, years ago, I was on some TV documentary and they asked me a question like this, like Jefferson and, and writing notes. And I described how um, after dinner parties, you know, he would write down the whole conversation that he heard or aspects of it uh, in notes and then save that as evidence to use down the road. And somehow the people doing that documentary <laughs> didn't interpret it the way, way I meant it. And so there's a scene, I, I come on screen and I say something like, um, you know, Jefferson took notes about dinner conversations so that they, he could use them later. And then you see <laughs> a scene with a dinner party and Jefferson at the head of the table. And while everyone's talking, he's going. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> But yeah, and then, you know, in his retirement, uh, he pulled together his, his letters while he was Secretary mm -hmm. of State and those notes and bound them together into, you know, three bound volumes that represented the history of Washington's administration. So he considered those um, primary evidence in a sense. Yeah, and, th and that's what the big, one of the reasons I asked the question, it was, it's a great question, is it seems to me from a, histor from a historian's perspective, those kinds of that documentation of meetings of interactions and all that is so important to helping us tell the stories that we need to be able to tell about about history and um i don't know if you had any comment on that i, I don't want to pontificate too much about it but yeah no i i think maybe we stop um mm -hmm. and then if we can have an after party if people stick around <laughs> um, I will say, um, I'm going to keep you in suspense about next week because I haven't decided yet what okay. I want to talk about. Uh, I will decide that soon and it'll get posted the next couple weeks. Um, at some point, I'm going to talk about sensory history, which I know during an after party we talked about the process of trying to feel things and be in places where things happened mm -hmm. and what that can or can't tell you. But um, at any rate, watch um, on Facebook and Twitter uh, soon for an announcement of whatever the heck the topic's gonna be next week. Uh, and until then, um, everybody stay safe, uh, be happy, read primary sources, and think about history. <laughs> and go to, and go to nche.net and come visit us. <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, if there are folks who want to watch any of these episodes after the fact, they're all posted on nche.net backslash conversations. Correct. And for the last couple of weeks, we have been putting these on our Facebook page. So you can join our Facebook page and see them as well. So um, my understanding is they are still on there. And with that, I'm going to stop the Facebook feed. So goodbye, Facebook world. Thank you. And everybody else, we are uh, <laughs> going to go ahead and stop. <laughs>